Happy Friday, everybody, on this episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Sonic the Hedgehog 3, it's wrapped production, and they've even given us a little bit of a shadow tease. I know that'll excite Ray. Also, legendary, iconic, one of my favorites ever, Louis Gossett Jr. has died at the age of 87. Star Trek 4, yeah, I, apparently Paramount is carrying on the joke that this movie's still going to happen, but they just took a major step by hiring a new writer for it. Also, did Iron Fist actor Finn Jones just tease that he's actually coming into the MCU? And Godzilla vs. Kong, or Godzilla x Kong, is now in theaters. Ray and I went to go see it yesterday. What did we think about it? We'll talk about that and a few things more. The John Campy Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the Planet Earth, the John Campion Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff not just giving you our opinions, but hopefully also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. Uh, joining me on this Friday, we got Ray Ora. Yeah, happy Friday. Jonathan Voiko's here. What's going on? The delightful Chris Carr is here. Hi, guys. And most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day, and here's how the show's going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics we listed off, and then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you guys have a thought, theory, opinion, question, or observation you'd like us to address on the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat, and as long as it's appropriate to be addressed on our show, we'll talk about those in the second part of the show. All right, guys. With that down... Let's move on to our first story here, shall we? The Sonic the Hedgehog films are delightful. Uh, I, and I got to admit, it's one of those films where there's about, I don't know, maybe about 10 of these things where there are movies that were coming out that I thought, this is a lame idea. This is going to be stupid and this will never work. And that was me with the first Sonic movie. And then it came out and I'm like, well, holy crap. That was really wonderful. I loved it. I, I thought, you know, Sonic is delightful. I love James Marsden in it. I, I mean, Jim Carrey, like in peak Jim Carrey form. He's so good in it. And he's so good in that. So and then amazing. they did the second film. I thought, okay, well, are they going to have the, you know, the sophomore jinx here? Nope. Crushed it. I, I thought, I, I mean, I still think I like the first one more, but the second one was completely charming and delightful too. And they're making a three. And of course, in the post credit scene, of the second one, something happened that I had no idea what they were doing because <laughs> they showed uh, somebody else and I had no idea, but everybody else in the theater seemed to know who Shadow uh -huh. was because everybody else in the theater went crazy <laughs> when they showed Shadow. Shadow is coming. Well, we knew that a Sonic 3 was coming and now it's closer than ever because this movie that's supposed to come out later this year yes. is now officially wrapped production. Uh, the folks over at The Gamer have revealed that the, sh the movie is now done, and more so, they shared a social media post by the director, Fowler. The director put up this post on social media, signifying that they have wrapped production with that oversized clapper showing Knuckles? What's the name of the stupid little thing on the bottom? <gasps> Tails? How Tails. dare Sorry, you? I don't, I don't know its name. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Tails? And then you can remember because he's got two tails, John. Oh, okay, well, that we should give it away. <laughs> then on the far right, we've got Sonic. And then I had to ask Ray and Chris earlier. It's like, aren't those all Sonic? <laughs> other than the other than wow. tails. <laughs> this hedgehog racism. I know. <laughs> right in the middle is Shadow saying, that's a wrap. Now, people who are fans of the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise, a game I played very little of. I mean, I was more on the Nintendo systems back when the, the Segas were out and stuff like that. But uh, I, I I gauge from a lot of people online who are fans of Sonic, they were very excited to see Shadow in there. So I have to ask Chris, why are people like, what is Shadow besides my dog? What is Shadow? That's true. That's true. Uh, my dog's name, one of my dog's names is Shadow. <laughs> Uh, Shadow, what is Shadow and why are people so excited Shadow's that Shadow's coming? Shadow's a really coming? epic character within the Sonic franchise here with a very convoluted backstory. He's incredibly powerful. Um, he has ties to the Robotnik family. 
Um, depending on how they go about this in the movie is going to be very, very interesting. But really, really powerful, very, very mysterious. Um, and people love him. I mean, Ray's got the plush. I mean, he's the yin, yin to uh, Sonic's yang. Yeah. Yeah. He's intense. He's, he's, tough um whereas you know knuckles is kind of like that for to it for a while too right. of he's you know brooding and everything whereas sonic's more of this kind of fun happy-go-lucky i like to eat chili dogs kind of character right and and sonic and our and knuckles and and shadow shadow in particular very very intense he's like the weapon x of these hedgehogs and he's very like <laughs> weapon it almost, x of hedgehogs it almost seems like well in the new sonic prime series he's more like the big brother role sure. like if you get too high he'll keep you grounded like he'll so keep if he's Sonic too many grounded. edibles, he'll be like, you know, hey, man, Son come on, you can just power through this. <laughs> if Sonic gets, gets too cocky, he's the voice in Sonic's head that says, look, it's not the battle's not over or this and that. He's eventually going to join this team. Like, yeah. we all know this. Do we? Yeah. It, it's going to happen. Do we think it's a possibility we see him, like, at the end of the TV series that's coming out? That's what I was wanting well, to say. Well, I mean, actually. like... They've already showed that we're we're gonna see Sonic yeah. in it. We're and, and gonna Knuckles. see Tails yeah. in it. Um, and by the way, that Knuckles series comes out next month. Yeah, I'm so excited. It but, actually looks better than I thought it was yeah. gonna look. It I'm I'm legitimately excited. Huge to watch record breaking it. views, I believe, too, for that trailer. Oh yeah, huge yeah. massive trailer. Idris Elba's Elba's the voice of Knuckles is just gold. They'll, so good. They'll save Shadow for the the next film. I don't think they'll even. But but remember record. remember the movie is coming out like seven months after the Knuckles series. And Shadow's a big selling point of that third movie. Yeah. You don't think they'll take advantage I've, somewhere in I, the series the to end. kind of hype up? Uh, yeah, I think at the end, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it, it's leading you into the movie. A well, credit. It's, post it's credit. Promised post credit. that we now have a Sonic cinematic universe. And so I think it'd be foolish if we didn't get a little Easter egg, just some kind of Marvel phase one or two kind of situation here at the end here. I don't want him to be omnipresent. I want that show to be about Knuckles training the deputy. I want it to be a fun character exploration. And then I want a little thing at the end where I see some more shadow goodness. I, I do find it strange they haven't announced who's going to voice Shadow. Oh, I was about that? to bring that up. No, no, they haven't announced it, but there are rumors. Yeah. There are uh, rumors. He's rumors perfect. That Before you say it, he's perfect. Good Canadian kid, <laughs> Star Wars alum, Hayden Christensen is the person who is currently being whispered that might be doing the voice of Shadow. Yeah, right. Now, not knowing the Shadow character, I can make no testimony about whether I think this is a good fit to the character or not. I just like seeing a good Canadian kid popping up and things. <laughs> of course. Now and again, if there. But what would you guys, like, you guys are the, the Sonic people. Mm -hmm. What would you think about, Chris? Well, these about two are. Hayden yeah. Christensen. I love it. Voice. I love having, well, one, I like that Hayden Christensen is getting his flowers. We're going to talk about yeah. another actor today, too, who got blamed for stuff that's outside of their control. Hayden Christensen was a phenomenal actor, like Glass House, all, all those kinds of things. Um, he was wonderful. And then the Star Wars prequels, while it gave him a new platform of stardom, it also really botched his career for a while. He didn't write those movies. George Lucas did. Yes. And we still let him make movies, gosh darn it. And... Hank Christensen, I love that he's having this kind of reemergence because of shows that I haven't been crazy about, but he does a great job in them. Right. He's wonderful when he pops in Ahsoka. He's wonderful in Did Obi you ever Wan. see him in My Life as a House? Yes, that's what I meant, not Glass, yeah. glass Houses. My Life as a House. My Life as yes. a House. Isn't Glass so that's good? That's something very different. Oh, the <laughs> Sobieski actress, what's her name? L I don't forgot her name, but. Lily Sobieski. Yeah, yeah, uh, wasn't yeah. she in there? <laughs> Probably. Now, I noticed that Hayden is, is from Vancouver. Do you think he'll be a nominee for the Vancouver Film Society Hall of Fame? <laughs> would that please you, John? Would you be so excited no, about that? that would be just as useless. Okay. That would be as just as useless. As long as all things are equally useless, I'm okay. <laughs> That's my motto. <laughs> anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? Sonic 3 is wrapped. The production is now done. It's coming out later this year. Uh, are you excited about it? Do you think it'll be Hayden Christensen? Do you think we'll get a shadow cameo, even if it's in a post credit scene in the upcoming Knuckles series? Maybe you don't watch any of this stuff. That's fair, too. Whatever you guys think, <laughs> jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to something a little bit sadder. When I was a child, uh, a movie called An Officer and a Gentleman came out. That is, I mean, listen, if you're going to put together like a 20-minute sizzle reel of like how great Hollywood can be, mm. somewhere in there will be at least a two-second snippet of An Officer and a Gentleman. It, and I know probably a lot of you guys haven't seen it. 
you should. It's it's a powerful, wonderful movie. Richard Gere. Uh, was, was that Deborah Winger? Yes. Yes. And everyone's and, at least seen Richard Gere doing the "I got no place to go." I got no place to and go, they, and then picking her up. Yeah. And they've definitely seen. Come on, love lifts us up where we belong. Well, that's right. The music "Love so Lifts Us Up Where We Belong," where the eagles fly. <laughs> anyway, so, but the X factor of that movie that pushed it from being a really nice, solid little romantic and and powerful like good movie to being an iconic awesome movie was the academy award winning performance of lou gossett jr a definitely not pc <laughs> character by any nope. stretch of the imagination you boy but my god i remember as a child and i don't know how on earth i got to see this movie i mean it was definitely on home vhs Maybe my mom and dad got to watch it and I snuck. It's like, oh, there's a movie and I put yeah. it in, but whatever. But I remember thinking, oh, that's what real acting looks like. And of course, he won the Academy Award that year, not long after he had already won an Emmy, by the way. And he became the first African American to win Best Supporting Actor at the Academy Awards. And he was incredible, even in recent years. Popping up in things like the recent Color Purple, The Watchmen. I remember when I when he popped up in The Watchmen, like, oh my God, it's Luke Gossett Jr. Mm -hmm. Like I was so excited about that. And of course, who could forget Iron Eagle? Iron Eagle, baby. Iron Eagle, mm. the 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 what's the Dante's Peak to Top Gun's uh, volcano or whatever <laughs> <There you laughs> it go. was. It was like the little oh, ripoff child that, of yeah, Top Gun. I preferred Dante's Peak. But it was, it, it was Iron Eagle. It was everything Lou Gatz Jr. could do. Listen, and just throughout the decades, he's been insanely good. And I, I saw this news. There it is. There's a poster for Iron Eagle. I remember um, reading. And, you know, there, there's very much a element to Lou Gossett Jr. There's a regalness to him as well. There always has been. Like for the last four decades that like he's a guy who is in the words of Robert Meyer Burnett, when he's around, he classes the joint up an exceptional talent and with incredible longevity right into his late eighties, he was still appearing in prominent television and movies. And it, it hit me with a real hammer of sadness when I read this morning that he passed away. Here's some little history for you. Me and Anne's first exposure to this actor was on Sesame street. When really? he's a celebrity guest, and there was a part where he's jogging like he's in a marathon, and they had that dun 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 playing on TV. Wasn't uh, he in Enemy Mind? Wasn't I was just about alien? to bring up one of the most underrated sci-fi epics of all time that a, an entire episode, Rob will be able to tell you this, mm -hmm. an entire episode of Star Trek The Next Generation was basically based on this thing. Lou Gossett Jr., I believe it was Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid, I have it here. That he starred opposite of in Enemy Mind, a truly underrated science fiction, uh, great, great, great film. Uh, somebody just, I was about to bring it up. Somebody in the live chat just mentioned Digstown. Mm -hmm. How Town. great is he in Digstown? Digstown. Um, and again, just as we got later in his two career and his life, I it would just make me so happy when I would like, I'm watching again, Watchmen and he popped up. I'm like, holy crap, he's in this. And then when we were at CinemaCon last year and they were showing us the, the previews and the sizzles for color purple, it's like, man, look at this cast. Wait, is that Lou Gossett Jr.? And he's in there too. Um, yeah, I... Very, very bummed uh, today uh, to yeah. hear about the passing of Lou Gossett Jr., but what a career, uh, what an icon, what what a representative for the entertainment right. industry. Hollywood would forever be sprinkled with a little bit of Louis, Louis Gossett, Gossett Jr. Jr. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, it just just the best, and, and, and our, obviously our heartfelt condolences and everything to those who knew uh, and loved him. Uh, Louis Gossett Jr. dies at the age of 87, ladies and gentlemen. All right. With that sad news out of the way, let's move on to this. Star Trek IV is kind of like the urban legend of, 
well, who's the tall, skinny man that people say that will come get the Slender kids? Slender Man? Slender Man, yeah. It's kind of become the Slender Man of the entertainment My industry. God, it's, it's tall, tall, skinny, skinny man. man. <laughs> tall, no. Skinny man. <laughs> That's just Logan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's just my husband. <laughs> the Slender Man, in the sense that, you know, um, they've been talking about it forever, but it's this rumor, it's this whisper. It's like the beginning of Lord of the Rings when he Cape Blanchett oh, yeah. saying, rumor became myth, myth became legend. It's a whisper. Yeah, that's all it was. That, that it's not actually going to happen. Now I hear that going. music in my head, by the way. <laughs> so, but apparently this thing is still going and it's still alive and Paramount wants to get this thing done. And they just brought on kind of a heavyweight to write the new script for it. This comes to us from Variety, who wrote the following. Steve Yaki, I have no idea if that's how you pronounce his name, but it's hockey with a Y, so I'm going to pronounce it like that. Yaki. Mm -hmm. Creator of the Max series, The Flight Attendant, which I know a lot of people love that series. It's fabulous. Season yeah. one in particular was amazing. Um, he is joining Starfleet as the new screenwriter for Star Trek IV. Uh, then we're going to go down to this. Yaki's involvement in the most uh, is the most promising sign uh, of forward momentum for the project has had since has had since the playwright started his TV writing career on the MTV series Awkward and Scream before joining the writing staff. Special place in my heart of Supernatural for four seasons. Mm -hmm. His latest series, the Sandman Universe adaptation, The Dead Boy Detectives, will premiere on Netflix in April. All right. So they're still saying that Chris Pine is going to come back. That um, Zachary Quinto. Zachary Quinto oh, as Spock yeah. is going to come back. That Zoe Uhura's coming back? What's that? Zoe. Yeah, that Zoe back. Saldana is okay. going to come back. That Bones is going to come back. <gasps> That Yay. they're still saying they're, they they what what do you think they do about Chekhov though? Like do they recast or No, I don't think they'll recast. I feel like they'll say something about him leading his own mm. ship. Like he's been promoted to being a captain, he's off yeah. exploring new galaxies and new worlds and living his best life. I yeah, think they'll give him a beautiful be a good, little off camera. Probably a little thing. line like something goes wrong on the bridge and someone goes, Oh, I wish Chekhov was here. Yeah. Like mm. probably something like that. I mean, personally, I think they should recast. I mean, you know, that's how I feel about these things. Yeah. If, right, if an right. actor passes away, you you recast the role. The role, the show goes on. But I don't think they will, and that's fine. That's okay. Listen, I, Rob and I differ very greatly on this. <laughs> the The Star Trek films were great. I didn't like the second one nearly as much as the first and the third, but I, I still enjoyed the second one. I had I had some big problems with the second one. I did, but that third one, the one that Simon Pegg wrote. I really enjoyed it. I had a it. ball with the third I had one. Fun. I thought the third one was really good. And listen, this is much like Sonic. This Star Trek franchise was one that for a good three years, when they announced they were doing it, I mocked it. I said, Star Trek is a dead franchise. And and it, it, it was for all intents and purposes at that time. It was a completely dead franchise. Followers in the fan base of the show were literally dying off and not being replaced by younger new fans and all this kind of stuff. And I just thought this was a big waste of time. Then I went to a screening of the first JJ Abrams Star Trek and I'm like, you know what? That was pretty fun. That, that was a modern interpretation of Star Trek. And, and I, I thought it was quite good. Second one, not as good. Third one had an absolute blast with love the third one. Now there was originally whispers that they, that they had a script for Star Trek IV and that it was going to have Chris Hemsworth come back. Because mm -hmm. for those of you who don't remember, Chris yeah. Hemsworth was briefly in the first film playing Captain Kirk's dad. Mm -hmm. um, and then he was gone. This is before he was like the world famous Chris Hemsworth. And I've always kind of wanted to see that idea. Now, of course, and that idea fell away. Then there was the whole Quentin Tarantino situation that came yeah. up. That is Quentin Tarantino going to do a Star Trek film. That apparently is not happening. But apparently this Star Trek 4 thing is still on. And I'll tell you what. Sign me up. I want to see another one. Or beam you up. <laughs> beam me up. I want to see another one. I like this <laughs> cast. I like the movies they've made. Are they, like, Awesome. No. Are they going to, do they end up in the top 15 films of the year list? No, but I enjoy it. It's, it's, I enjoy this franchise. I would like to see them. And I think this is a really good positive uh, development for them, attaching a guy of this talent level to write the script. So we'll see. Anyway, Chris, 
You read about this. Did you watch Flight Attendant? Yes. And I really, really liked it. It honestly was a, because I had only seen Kelly Cuoco. That's Coco. Harley Quinn, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. I had only seen Kelly Cuoco in, um, like, Simple Rules to Date My Daughter and then Big Bang Theory. I Big forgot Theory. she was I, in that, the John Ritter show. Yep, yeah. And she was really delightful in that. I'm not a Big Bang Theory fan. Neither am I. Um, I, I just was always, uh, there's like a, there, I think there's a TikTok of it of somebody just reacting to all of the weird laughs at just any kind of nerd culture reference and then being like, that's nothing. That means nothing. Yeah, you but that, was also, about, that was a laugh track, wasn't yeah. it? My so. thing about Big Bang Theory was always this, because I watched it about, because so many friends of mine loved it, and so I tried it. Yeah. And I was just like, here's my description of Big Bang Theory. It's a show about geek culture, clearly written by people who have no idea about geek culture. Exactly. That, and that, that just, every time I try to watch an episode, that's the overwhelming 100%, feeling I have. 100%, 100%. Well, I like it, but moving on. If, and if it's your cup of <laughs> and tea, I'm glad you like it. I know a lot of, of people that like for it. it. I am, I really liked her in The Flight Attendant, though. It was a very different kind of thing from what I'd seen from her, and it really got me on board with her. I loved the writing style of it. I loved the, the plot that they had. It was really well done. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched the show, there is somebody who gets killed and she has all these conversations with the dead person, but it's just her thinking through everything. And that can be really cheesy and it's executed in such a great way. So this actually makes me really excited because this is a person who's dealt with genres all across different platforms, right? Dealing with Supernatural, dealing with Flight Attendant. I'm so intrigued and excited about Dead Boy Detectives. That exists in the world of Neil Gaiman. Those were created in 91 in one of the Sandman comics, and that will exist in the Sandman universe on Netflix, which I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I'm very excited about it. And I think that's something that'll really, really solidify me being even more pumped about their involvement with Star Trek. These are fun movies. They're popcorn movies. Do I think they're always firing on all cylinders? No. I was not a fan of like Alice Eve in these movies. Right. Um, of just like, I'm a doctor, but also I need to be naked almost to figure out how to do something. Just I like, don't see okay. any problem with The room with gets that. warm. You know. It's hard to think. It's hard to think with your clothes on. Gosh, <laughs> man. It's hard to think with your clothes on. Difficult. But I think for the most part, these are fun adaptations. It, it's an Elseworlds <laughs> of Star Trek. And I think if you have that as your mentality, then you can not be as precious with it. I don't mean that in any disrespectful way to someone like Rob who knows this lore inside and out, but that's how I always viewed it. I also was a TNG girl, so I don't have as much of a tie to the original sci-fi uh, Star Trek series. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a really good fit. I think this could be really cool and fun. All right, guys, question is for you. What do you think? So writer from Supernatural and Flight Attendant is coming on to write the script for Star Trek IV. Maybe this thing never happens. I kind of hope that it does. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, as Marvel made their big massive shift uh, a few months ago when the Netflix stuff was not going to be canon to the MCU. And then they decided, or Kevin Feige made the decision, you know what? We're changing course. We are going to make Netflix canon with the MCU. This is going to be not a new Daredevil being played by Charlie Cox, but the Daredevil from the Netflix series. When that all thing happened, everybody starts speculating, well, will John Bernthal come as Punisher? Will we see Elektra from that come in? Uh, Elodie Young, was that her name? Who played Electra? Yeah, I believe I so. Will she come over and do it? Where are we going to see this? Yeah, a lot of different opinions, a lot of discussion. But the one thing that everybody agreed on, we ain't going to see Finn Jones as Iron Fist. Because, let, let me look up the statistics. Yes, nobody liked Iron Fist. Uh, Iron Fist was the one show, which is too bad, because I thought it had, there, there, there were some good things in the show. <laughs> There were some good things in Iron Fist, but almost universally, obviously it's almost universally, not totally universally, almost universally, everybody agreed that was the worst thing in the, the whole Netflix era for the Marvel stuff. And everybody agreed, okay, yeah, that's the one character that's not coming back. But Finn Jones, who played Danny Rand, Iron Fist, the I'm sorry, the immortal Iron Fist, may have something to say about that or... It's just trying to be, technical term, there it is, a shit disturber. Because Danny Rand decided to very nonchalantly put up this social media post of a picture of him packing for a trip. Eh, back there, we got a little book of a never-ending story. Oh. Kind of like uh. that. But first, front and center, 
Power Man and Iron Fist. Mm -hmm. Right there at the top. Now, of course, this has made speculation start to go wild. That this is um, his way of kind of hinting that maybe we see Danny back. Mm -hmm. That maybe he does come back in this MCU. Isn't there lotion in that picture too somewhere? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Which would make it a very strange, <laughs> very strange material to need that much lotion for. Like I mean, never-ending story of the lotion. <laughs> Let me show you my Falcor. Anyway. Oh, boy. So, it sorry. is never oh, ending. I almost made Chris spit her tea. It is I'm never sorry, ending. Chris. Well, well, face that way. <laughs> I'm sorry that my instinct was to go towards you. I just drank. I, I was like, not the turn towards Jonathan. <laughs> So, okay, let me tell you why this might actually end up being something. If you're going to make something canon, then you're making it canon. We often have this discussion about Star Wars and what's in the books and what's not in the books. And ultimately now what's in the books is not canon. But, you know, I, I remember we have this debate. Something is not sort of canon. A, a girl is not sort of pregnant she's you're either pregnant what? or you're not it's one of the two there's no gray area there canon is canon or it's not and if they're going to say now that the mcu is canon that the mcu stuff that happened on netflix or the not the mcu stuff the marvel stuff that happened on netflix is now indeed canon to the mcu well then Danny Rand, the immortal Iron Fist, is there. And, and that's mm. a part of it. That doesn't mean you have to use him. That doesn't mean you have to go into it a lot. But you can't get around that this, you know, uh, Daredevil and uh, Jessica Jones, that they were in a team of the Defenders with this guy. That he was there. Now, that brings up another question about Luke Cage and all that kind of stuff, but that can be discussed another time. So... I, listen, I look at that and I hear people saying, this picture means that he's coming back. Well, you, it's not very far-fetched because if it's canon, it's canon. Now, do I actually believe that he's coming back? I don't know. This is one that's going to be, it's going to be a hard sell for even Kevin Feige to get, I think, Marvel fans amped up on the idea of the return of the Immortal Iron Fist. At least the one from the Netflix series. This might be one of the things where you go, well, yeah, the Netflix stuff was canon, but uh, we're just going to pretend that this part didn't happen. I, I don't know. Maybe. So personally, I don't buy it. I think this is just, I think this is just him then taking some, trying to stir the pot, maybe get people talking, maybe get some momentum going to having him come and be, I, I don't know. But I'm just saying this is one of those things where I don't think you're crazy if you buy into it because there is some reason there to, to believe it. Anyway, Chris, you saw this. I mean, I think you yeah. and I had this discussion before where neither you or I believe that even with the Netflix stuff coming over to the MCU that we thought we would see Finn Jones as Iron Fist. No. But what do you think about this little development? I mean, if this is true, we got to eat a lot of crow. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, in a way, I do want it to be true though because I've talked a lot on this show about how... I'm a Finn Jones apologist. Yeah. I don't, none of this was his fault. No, it was not. It was not. He did the best he could with it. I, much like with Hayden Christensen, Finn Jones did the best he could with what he was given and the time he was given. So if he is going to be in this series, if he is going to reemerge as the immortal Iron Fist, he is going to have to show up as such a badass. Mm. They are going to have to have him start his training now, get that fight choreography done like it is just textbook like it is mm -hmm. second nature to him because if you are going to give him a second shot not only do you have to correct the mistakes of the previous showrunner you have to get everybody on board with this guy yeah and if he comes back and he does the same kind of stuff it is not going to work at all in fact is going to be even more detrimental to what already happened with this character i think he's a fabulous actor i enjoy him very much and i would like to have him have another go at this role yeah i don't want to have to watch him like try to figure out his powers or deny that yeah. he even has powers exactly like, just He's accepted this. Now move forward. Move forward. And, you know, if we could make him just a teensy bit less whiny, just a little bit. I love when he gets to interact with Luke. I think that's when he thrives. He does a great job there. I yeah. always compare his character to the, the show Carnival. 
Where the oh. main character is always like, I don't want these powers. Yeah. I don't want to do this. I don't want to see. And oh, you're like, oh he, eventually he's going <laughs> to use his powers. And then he does. And he's like, now he's his story arc has moved forward. He's like, no, I still don't want it. I'm like, oh my God. Just who's, who's the name of the guy again who played Luke Cage? Uh, Mike, Mike Coulter. Yeah. yeah. Fuck that guy. <laughs> okay. You know what? Yeah. That guy. Uh, look, listen. <laughs> listen. All, Respectfully. Sure. Uni universe. <laughs> the universe is in balance, right? So when there's more water over here, that means there's a little less water to come over here. Mike Coulter. Why are we fucking... talking about wet things in Mike Coulter, John? <laughs> Why? Getting ready for you, the are you okay? Getting this ready guy. for some <laughs> iron fisting. Mike Coulter <laughs> no. has hijacked oh, no. <laughs> an unfair amount of share of handsome. That guy is so fucking good looking. It pisses me off. Like, why? Like, see, that's why I don't look better. It's because you <laughs> took all the handsome. He is, he is such like he's one of these guys. Then there, there are some some people like this where you look at them like actors and actresses. But there's a few of these around. But Mike Coulter is one of those guys where you look at him and you just pause for a second. It's like that's not right. <laughs> but yes, him and and and, uh, and Iron Fist had yeah. some very good on-screen chemistry. They had wonderful you know, you chemistry. know who he could start training with, who's been training, Mahershala. You know, there's like a lobby where people are just training and not making movies. Just well, Mahershala already Marvel. did something with Mike Coulter because he was. He oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. I, had, I had such an awkward moment uh, a few years back at Comic-Con. It was the last year. Like we kind of covered that together with, with Collider. And I was coming out of our like, you know, our room, our our media room. And I'm coming back from the restroom, going back to the media room, actually. And I, I Mike Coulter is walking toward me I'm like, oh, OK, well, you can't miss him. Yeah, so no, like, oh, hard okay, to miss uh, Let me just step to the side. You know, you go around celebrities, like, just get out of the way. I go to step away from the side, and Finn Jones comes over this way. I'm like, oh, um, I'll go over here. And all of a sudden, Jessica Jones walks out from nowhere. I'm like, oh, okay, let me just back up. Daredevil's behind me. And, he, and I literally, they're like, so did you get coffee? Oh, yeah, I got coffee. And I'm just awkwardly standing in the middle of the Defender's oh, Sandwich. As if I don't sandwich. even exist. And I'm like, I'm just going to squeeze through here. Defender Sandwich. By the way, uh, our viewer, Ron H., just came up with the perfect title for the new MCU Iron Fist. Uh, Iron Fist, prepare to be fisted. That's that's the... Well done, Ron. Thank you, man. Well Ron done, H. Ron. I thought better of you. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, Chris... Is he going to be in the MCU? I still feel no. I still feel like this is a no, but but boy golly, I hope you get to be in there, Finn. <laughs> anyway, guys. Hope it happens. Question is for you. What do you think about this? Uh, Finn's put up this picture with Iron Fist right front and center. Is he just toying with everybody? Is he trying to angle himself into the MCU? Or is he actually giving a tease to fans that something's coming? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's go on and talk about this, shall we? Godzilla x Kong Woo! is now out in theaters. Now, I, I should let some of you guys know, uh, for those of you asking me, where was the out-of-theater review? We recorded an out-of-theater review um, of Godzilla x Kong yesterday. The problem was when I got home and loaded it up, the wind was so bad, and I didn't even think about it at the time, but the wind was so bad, the audio was just unusable. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, I, I'm just not going to put it up. So my apologies to people who were looking for... <laughs> I, I couldn't stop laughing anyways in the after. I was just laughing. You were laughing the, the whole time we were doing I, it. I, yeah, just what I felt after we so watched it. So my apologies that, that that didn't go up, but we went to go see it. Now, uh, before we give you our thoughts on Godzilla X Kong, uh, just a reminder, like a lot of the first reactions that came out about Godzilla X Kong was that eh, pretty light on the story. Uh, but if you're looking for big monster fun, this is your movie. So that was kind of my expectation going in, right? So we go in to see Godzilla X Kong. So here's my thoughts. Let me start with the first part of that. This movie's dumb. <laughs> I mean, real dumb. There's some suspension of disbelief that you have just for human logic. Like sometimes in movies, people and characters will make completely illogical decisions or take completely illogical actions, but you just suspend your disbelief. There is so much stupidity in this movie with the human characters. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm going to mention a couple things. Uh, I, I, I had somebody message me today. Hey, when you review Godzilla X Kong, please don't spoil anything. Guys. Guys. 
It's a Godzilla King Kong movie. There's nothing to spoil. Okay? There's nothing to spoil. Do they destroy a city? And don't give him no lip, neither. Um, yeah, so Godzilla X Kong. Uh, just a couple things here. Talking about the human stupidity in, in the movie. There's a part where our main girl, of course, in every one of these movies, you discover old ruins. That's actually in the trailers. You see that part anyway. Mm -hmm. But she literally, she's looking at this piece on the wall. That's literally three lines. Three lines. And she goes, oh, this is the ancient writing of the Ipu. And it says this. And she goes on to tell a 15-minute story, like perfectly detailed story based on these three lines on the wall. I'm like, what? Oh, and, and there was a couple of pictures on the wall, but she's giving this fully with names, details, like all this kind of stuff. I'm like, oh my God, this is so bad. Also, a number of the characters just do some things that are completely, utterly ridiculous. They're, the movie on many, many occasions and many, many times completely uh, like goes beyond asking you to suspend disbelief. I mean, it's just nonsensical in play i mean just absolutely nonsensical and they break look i'm okay with a movie not adhering to real world logic but what i want a movie to do is to adhere to your own in movie logic like once you set up what the parameters of logic in your movie are just you stick to that they don't do that at all that goes completely out the window that said i had a ball watching this movie <laughs> this movie is so much ludicrous fun now there are there are other movies that are dumb as movies and they try to be fun but they're not mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're we see that a lot it's like it's people well john why can't you just have fun with it because it wasn't fun that's why i didn't have fun with it because it wasn't godzilla x kong is a freaking blast it was all the things I like knowing that the story was going to be kind of weak. Now, would I prefer a movie that had a great screenplay and great characters and great dialogue and great monster action? Absolutely. I would have preferred that, but I knew I wasn't getting that. So, okay. I know I'm not getting that. <clears throat> Do you deliver on the big giant monster action? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so much. Yes. And they don't wait. The movie opens with Kong on a hunt. Like that's how the movie starts. And then we quickly get to see Godzilla. Like you guys saw in the trailer, there's Godzilla fighting the giant ma massive crab, right? Right. Right in the first five minutes of the movie. Yeah. Or early first 10 minutes of the movie, whatever, right? They they do that, they have a lot of stuff, then Kong and Godzilla get come together. And you know, obviously you've seen the trailer, Godzilla and Kong initially fight, and that was great. Got some great ground and pound going on. Nice. <laughs> And then some profile. I never knew I needed to see a Titan suplex another Titan. Never knew I needed to see that, but saw some good UFC ground and pound going on. It was great. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know, they team up because they show us in the trailer as well. They team up to fight Scar King and Shimu. 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 Mm. Sh not Simu Liu. Yeah. Shimu. Who Shang Chi. But oh, Shimu? that would have been amazing, though. Yeah, they team up to fight. Oh. <laughs> to fight Shang-Chi. Nope. That's so so we see that come together. They're gonna, they have this big, you know, tag team championship of the world fight. And there is tag teaming going yeah, on. Yeah, there is, there is. There is absolute Heart Foundation level tag this, teaming going on. By the way, Godzilla's rocking the t the Heart Foundation. Yeah, yeah. Colors. This this movie was like a roller coaster of really and oh shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> really? So it's like, no so it's like, really? But then they get into the, oh shit. Yeah. There's the, oh shits outweigh the release in this movie for me, at least. I mean, it's, it's everything you want. Like the trailers actually misled me. I thought we we're going to play the long game with Godzilla. Like he's sleeping the whole time. And, and then, then just kind of pops up the near end. the end. Right. Yeah. Honestly, no. this is a Godzilla X Kong. Like every other scene is either one of them. And then you get the human scenes in the middle. It, do you it's, think this is fair to say? Just considering the whole movie and the story and all that kind of stuff, it's more a Kong movie than it is a Godzilla oh, movie. But that, we did a lot of there's Godzilla. There's some talking parts in there where I was like, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, for you Kong fans, I'm Team You're Godzilla. A lot of Kong because you guys are making me choose. So I'll, I'll always be Team Godzilla. But I love Kong too. 
for you Kong fans, if you go and watch this film, you're going to be happy. You're going to be happy. That's all I'm going to say. You'll be happy because there's some... Yeah, yeah. Let's just leave it as that. I'll, yeah. I'll wait for people to watch. And listen, I've never, I've never understood, admittedly, the love a lot of people have for Mothra. I, I, I honestly have never really understood. I mean, I have no problem with Mothra, but I've never understood... Mothra's pretty great in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Mothra's pretty great in the movie. And, I, <laughs> man, and you know what? Dan Stevens and um, Bi Bi Brian, Brian uh, Tyree. Tyree T. Tyree Henry. Tyree Henry. Henry. They had good chemistry yeah, together on it. screen. Yeah. They legitimately had <laughs> some lot. good chemistry on screen. I, I was funny like, moments. I was. I left the theater in tears, like from laughing. You were giggling, even just because it was all the way so, out. You were giggling. It was so dumb, but I really loved the movie. I mean, it was like a perfect Mixed. mix of dumb and dumber. Just do me a favor. Look up the um the, the Rotten Tomato score right now, because right. here's the thing. As we were describing, the, like, look, th there's no getting around. The movie is really stupid. I, I mean, I'm not going to get around. And it's so, at 53 percent now. It's at 53. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? More than half. You know what? I totally get it. I have. I I take no issues. With somebody who went into that movie and wanted a more well-rounded movie mm -hmm. and was let down by it was just I have no problems with that because I could totally see why you feel that way. Hundred percent no argument for me. Does it... But for me, this movie delivered what I was like knowing what I wasn't gonna get left me with then you better give me a lot of this. Like if you're not gonna give me this, you better have a really good helping of this. And they gave it, and it was a for me. It was just a lot of fun. It was a pretty good turnout too for a four o'clock showing. It was, it when, was a good sized crowd. Whenever I start seeing actually the front row of like the the lower seats start, uh, people start getting into those. That's where I kind of did, does your box office uh, prediction change after seeing that turnout yesterday? I mean, uh, I think the, the official box office prediction is above my. I think my it's looks. sixty-five. I, I, I honestly really because yeah. the official the 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 official projections were fifty to fifty-five. Yeah, which will be great if it does fifty to fifty-five. That's that's bigger than Godzilla versus Kong. That's bigger than a bigger opening than Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yeah. It's great if it does, but I mean, sixty-five is not out of the question. It's because there was a bunch of like not kid kids, but there are a lot of younger kids there, and like if they group. If they start grouping and watching this like today, I I, I could see it make making sixty five. But you you haven't changed your stance on the fifty. You think it's a solid fifty? So. I think still fifty to fifty five. I think that's good. But listen, I'm, but again, I'm not going to be surprised because what do you got? You got a Dune two that's been in theater for five weeks. You got Kung Fu Panda four, which has been in theater for three or four weeks. You got Ghostbusters Frozen Empire two. Uh, what's that? Two weeks for Ghostbusters. This will be its yeah. second weekend. This will be its second weekend, and I don't think a lot of people are going back to watch Godzilla Frozen or Godzilla Frozen Empire. I don't think a lot of people are <laughs> going empires. back to watch Ghostbusters yeah. Frozen Empire a second time. So I, it's it's possible if people just want to go to the movies that the one true option there for you right now is Godzilla X Con. So maybe it could it could exceed that. Mm -hmm. I do think though this is going to be like a sixty percent plus drop off next week though. But what is opening next week? I don't know. Right. Anything. Because, oh. I, I mean, like, for instance, we got Monkey Man coming. Yeah. Right. That's, but the, Monkey I don't Man think, is not going to be a $40 million opening film. That's going to do good if it does John Wick 1 numbers. Right. Like, I I cannot wait for Monkey yeah. Man. But let's be honest, it's not going to have a huge opening weekend. So I, I think Godzilla X Kong can have a strong opening weekend. And I'm going to go opposite from you, Jonathan. I'm going to say it takes a less than 60% drop. Right. Weekend. More than 50. Ooh. I think it'll be between 50 mm -hmm. and 60. Can I say the body count? of humans in this film had to reach the billions. <laughs> They're just tossing around buildings and I'm like, there's people in that building. <laughs> yeah, there's, there is probably a large body count. There, There is a large... I mean, since the first first Godzilla 2014, there's not many humans left. <laughs> there's, there's actually a really good line that low-key kind of addresses something that people talk about in these, you know, these kaiju movies, mm -hmm. which is... Listen, when these kaijus fight in a city, I mean, the cities get kind of devastated, right? So the shot that we see in the trailer of Godzilla fighting the giant crab legs, right? That takes place in Rome? I think yeah, it takes place yeah, in yeah. Rome, right? And she's she's on the phone with, like, one of the heads of the government, like, all pissed off. And she's like, 
remind the prime minister that if it wasn't for Godzilla, the entire city would have been wiped out. So yeah. just take, you know, be thankful for what happened. And, uh, and I'm going to say one last thing. It's not about this movie, but we saw a trailer for uh, the apes, the new apes movie. Yeah. Planet of the I'm on board with that now. I just had to point that out because I didn't, I wasn't interested, but that new trailer that they played before the movie. It's not a new trailer. It's actually been around oh, for a while. Oh, it has. Yeah. I haven't seen it then. Yeah, I, could, I, could, I was listening to your reactions like, Ray has not seen this trailer. Yeah, yet. I have not. <laughs> yeah, you were, you were I, yeah. liking a lot. But I, again, listen, it it's a... Man, if you're looking for <laughs> for a uh, a great... if you Look, if you're looking for Godzilla minus one, that's not this movie. <laughs> but this movie delivers a lot of stuff that Godzilla minus one doesn't deliver. So it's it's kind of a balancing act. Chris, what has been your anticipation level, if anything, for this movie? Are you surprised by what you're hearing coming out of the reviews? Is it right, you know, zoning up? What do you think? This is all I want. Ray <laughs> talking about how the body counts in the billions. Let's go. Let's go. So I just want the Kaiju to fight. That's all. Godzilla minus one. Monarch. These are wonderful, beautiful explorations about worlds that happen to have Kaiju in them. And we get a really lovely humanistic approach to those stories. And they're executed so well. And I love that. But also... Sometimes I want Kaiju to just smash a bunch of shit. So I, I can I can live in two worlds and I want to go to this one. You know what's really interesting in this movie? For the first three quarters of the film, uh, the significant stuff, other than the stuff in the first five minutes that does happen on the surface, like with Godzilla and the Crab Monster, most of the movie in the first three quarters takes place in Hollow Earth, right? So with a lot of these fights that say Kong is getting into, other than the fact that you see a lot of trees, you you forget the scale. Like, you forget the size of Kong. That was kind of my fear. Right. So, the, down there, and then we meet Baby Kong, right? Yeah. And you see Baby Kong in the trailer. And you forget that Baby Kong is still a titan. Right. And so, when they come, I remember when they come to the surface, and the, the fight starts taking place on the surface, which we see glimpses of in the trailer, and Baby Kong goes through a building. It's like, oh, that's right. Baby Kong is still yeah. a kaiju. He's still a monster. He's still <laughs> bigger than a 20-story building. I mean, right, it's, right. which that, is that's, fun. It's, the film is just loads of fun, especially the third act. That That's where I started hearing audibly the theater. People like like, people like yeah, start. I will say this, though, with, without giving too many details. Um, there's a part in this movie where in a big combat scene, how do I word this? Kong uses Diddy Kong in the fight. So I'm going to say, you'll see what I mean when it happens. And I was like, I can't believe they're doing this. Like I was just kind of loose. And who knew that in a kaiju movie, a toothache could become a major story plot point. Oh, yeah. A toothache becomes a major story point <laughs> in the movie. You will also see what we're talking about. Hmm. And guys, I had a blast. A again, I'm not going to argue with anybody who comes to me and say, I thought that movie sucked. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i say to them, I could see how you feel that way. I really do. But I had a blast. Yeah. And I think if you just go in to this movie, there are other movies that promise to be dumb but fun that don't deliver the fun. This movie delivers the fun. And, and I think if you just go with that kind of a mindset, if you just go to watch a WWE wrestling match between four kaiju, I think you're in for a blast. So that's our take on it, guys. Question is for you. Did you guys have a chance to see Godzilla X-Kong so far? If so, what did you think? Maybe you're one of those totally reasonable people who said, you know what? I thought it was a big loser of a film. Granted, maybe you're more like me. It's like, I had a blast with it. Maybe you have no interest in seeing it. How big of an opening weekend do you think it's going to have? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, before we get on to your live questions and hear from our uh, sponsor today, there are other things going on in the world of movie news. So this is a new little segment we have called In Other News. Jonathan, what do we got going on? All right. Well, for those fans of uh, 1990s um, nun impersonation movies, there's maybe some hope on the way for you. Whole genre. Yeah. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg confirms that Sister Act 3 is still on the way, or is it? I mean, 92 was our first uh, delve into Sister Act. 93 was the, was the uh, sequel. With Back the in the Habit. Name, Back in the Habit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Interesting quote from from Whoopi. It's uh, it's still on the way. Uh, they, the studio, have not said we're over you and this movie. So, I 
guess that's kind of positive. We're not over you. <laughs> it's not something I want to hear from like a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I, honestly, but... as an actor, what high praise. Yeah, but you know, this is still, you know, Tyler Perry's still attached to uh, produce this. So, John, uh, do you buy or sell Sister Act 3? Well, she says they're still developing the script, yeah. too. I sell this. Look, who who didn't like Sister Act? At the beginning, back, it, it was such a product of the early 90s. Sister Act, I even liked Back in the Habit, but... Sister Act 2 is better. You, yeah, I it's liked great. it. It's great. I liked it. Lauren Hill up in there? Come on. But... No, it, it it is it is so dated at this point. I mean, we've had in a world where we've had Pitch Perfect, we don't need another sister act. I don't think this will actually happen. Uh, of course, if it happens, I'll give it a shot. But it was such a product of its time, and I loved them for what they were. But no, I I, I got to sell this, Chris. I buy that it is in development because we live at a time where people love 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 to mine old IP and run it into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I love Whoopi Goldberg. I love the sister act films uh i think the second one is incredible i think about it often um i used to be a cantor at my church too so that was just like the dream was to like actually <laughs> sing cool good music that people liked <laughs> instead of my weird catholic mass music that is very john mulaney the bread of bread is bread <laughs> um, but i think i think they're definitely talking to her still all right, what's next? <laughs> All right. Well, everyone's favorite Harkonnen, Austin Butler, is back. Uh, he's going to be taking a lead role in Darren Aronofsky's next movie, a baseball crime drama called Caught Stealing. Um, oh. oh! Okay. Okay. <laughs> hey. uh, novelist Charlie Hudson is going to... Uh, Houston will be uh, adapting this work to the screenplay. Caught Stealing uh, was originally set for 2013. And uh, P. Willie was attached now to the Patrick role that... Wilson, and I think oh. Alec Baldwin was supposed to be in it too back yeah. in 2013. Oh. Yeah. And was attached or is attached? Was. Was. Oh. Now, yeah, yeah. It's, now it's the, Austin Butler. For the 2013 no role. Yeah, yeah. No um, there. Just a quick uh, story synopsis. Uh, the story follows Hank Thompson, a former high school baseball prospect turned alcoholic bartender. I've known a couple of them. Who gets caught up in a treasure hunt uh, through New York City. A sadistic police officer tries to outrun Thompson, hitmen, and mobsters to find the treasure. And Alec Baldwin was in the role of the uh, policeman before when it was still in the, you know, development. John, do you buy or sell this news? I buy it. I mean, look, treasure hunting, Austin Butler, Darren Aronofsky. Why not? Now, do, are they sure this isn't a Cheers remake? <laughs> a former baseball guy becomes Meets bar national owner. treasure. It's, yeah, but now he's seeking treasure. I would treasure. love for Ted Danson to do that. <laughs> if Ted Danson was in yes. it, it would be gold. Sign me Ted up. Danson and Nick Cage for your little... Uh, <gasps> What's his treasure hunting movies called again? National, yeah, Na National, National Treasure. Treasure. Yeah. National Treasure and Cheers Cross. That's what this is. Beautiful. It's Cheers and National Treasure. You know what? With these people involved, I think this sounds like fun as a buy for me. Chris? I would buy, but I'd be a low stakes investor. <laughs> because, <laughs> one, four. But two, because this has been in development hell for a little while. And also, Houston, while he has a very, very wide array of things that he's written for, novels, comics, he wrote for Moon Knight, uh, he wrote for a series I loved, Powers. I loved that series so much, but he also wrote for Gotham. And I know that everyone can have a bad day or a few misses here, so, you know, I know that he's very familiar with that crime pulpy world. I just don't know if this is a world he'll thrive in. All right, what's next? All right, well, I actually always forget that Brett Goldstein is a co-creator of Shrinking, but Shrinking co-creator Brett Goldstein is joining the cast. He's going to be jumping in front of the camera for season two, something that um, they wanted to try to have happen last season, but they just could never get it worked out. Um, pretty straightforward story, uh, nothing much more than that, but uh, he's going to be rejoining Jason Segel, of course, and uh, Harrison Ford. Um, do you buy or sell this, John? Brett Goldstein jumping in front of the camera. I buy the hell out of this. First of all, I'm just thrilled to find out that they are actually going to make Shrinking Season 2. This was one of the best new shows on television in the last couple of years, and I'm shocked how many people have not watched it. Harrison Ford is better than he's been in years yeah. uh, in this movie. Jason Segel's great in it. It's incredibly funny. It's very heartfelt. Brett, in like he was an MVP in um, uh, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. Roy, Roy Kent. As, he, as Roy Kent, he is he, like, again, one of the MVPs of that show. Oh, yeah. Having him actually come into the series, I love it. Big buy for me. Chris? Take all of my money. 
to take all of it right now. I love this. He is wonderful. He is a co-creator on this. I first absolutely fell in love with Brett in the show Derek, the Ricky Gervais show, who's obviously wonderful on Ted Lasso. And I think he is probably the only person in existence who loves the Muppets more than I do. <laughs> uh, if you haven't, treat yourself to his one-man show of Muppet Christmas Carol on the internet. You're welcome. Uh, I think this will be fantastic. He'll fit in so well. It'll be great. And if you haven't seen his cameo in the Harley Quinn animated series, oh you my gosh. really should. All right, what's next? All right, so uh, some uh, could be sad news or good news, depending on if this uh, deal goes through, but Alamo Drafthouse Cinema Circuit is up for sale. Um, the news comes out about a week before CinemaCon, of course, That and they've also shopped around um, the, the purchase of uh, uh, Alamo Drafthouse to some... Uh, studios, but so far the 41 uh, locations across 13 states have has no bidders yet. They did escape, um, you know, bankruptcy back in 2021. Uh, so they've been thriving. It, they're mar the the business has been doing fairly good, but it's up for sale now, and so far no takers. John, do you buy or sell the selling of Alamo Draft House? I buy it now. It's it's not a big secret that I do not like the owner of Animal Draft House at all, but this is one of those separating the you know, the uh, creator from the creation, I really do like the Alamo Draft House that they built. It's 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 a really wonderful theater chain. But like Jonathan just mentioned, they barely got out of, they barely survived bankruptcy, which of course all the movie theaters had a big, big problems coming mm -hmm. out of the uh, pandemic. Uh, but, and, and you know what? It's difficult and it's hard and it's expensive to run these things. And if they are just realizing, you know what? It's just time for us to get out of this business and sell it while we can. I think it's probably a good move. Anyway, Chris, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I would buy this. I love Alamo Draft House. I love it so much. And hey, if they need money, sell it. This is, this is one of my favorite places to see movies. They are so great about not letting people use their phones. They're the best in the business at that. Oh, I love that they do that. I don't know what happened to like 75% of y'all when you were in theaters now. You're animals. I don't know what's happening texting, having full-on conversations. You know, We're not in your living room. We're I not gotta, in your living room, James. I Get gotta, out of here. I got to say, at Burbank 16, I'm shocked. It's They're relatively good behavior at Burbank 16. Oh, the yep. Regal? You know, the Tyler, the Tyler the that we go to is actually pretty but good But I know there's too. nightmare stories, so. Mm. All right, what's next? All right, so finally, a new Chucky movie, guys, is in the works, says uh, Don Mancini, the creator of the the, uh, the IP. Um, Chucky, uh, the TV show, is actually entering its third season now on Sci-Fi Network. But uh, Don says that a new movie is coming out, and the movie is supposed to kind of work between back and forth with season two and the upcoming season of uh, the Chucky series. Of course, uh, Child's Play has never actually been rebooted, unlike so many horror franchises. Oh, it was. Yeah, well, we had uh, Mark Hamill doing the voice. Really? Was that not an offshoot? Because according to the article, it says since uh, the first Child's Play, these all fall in order. Maybe these are back in, in canon. Yeah, like that one might just be considered separate. It was kind of the one they did with Mark Hamill was kind of a reboot in a way, mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, you know, this, uh, this movie's coming. It's been seven years either way. You buy or sell a new Child's Play. Sell it! Nobody cares about Chucky anymore. I mean, and, and listen, it is the dumb, look, if you want to try to take a reshot, like if you want to try to truly reboot it with the classic Chucky doll and all that kind of stuff, and you want to do that, I think there's, there's something to be said for that, but continuing it and making it part of the TV series that very few people watch to start with, th that's a monumental mistake. If you want to do a movie, do a movie, but trying to make it a continuation or a tie-in with the TV show, a TV show that hardly anybody watches, I don't understand the logic behind this. For me, it's a sell. Chris? In what world? <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and give you that. Yeah, because I In already know the answer. what world am I buying anything with horror? <laughs> no, get it away from here. Get that osh gosh bagosh nightmare far away from me. Chuck off. Chuck, Chuck off, off, indeed. <laughs> well done, Ray. Yeah, I gave that to you. Thanks. That's yours. <laughs> Thanks. It it's, for you. it's yours. You, You're smart. No, You're you funny. did. Please, I will. I'm never going to use it again. Okay, I'll yeah. keep it. All right, guys. <laughs> With that all down, we're going to go over and start taking your live comments and questions. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank the sponsor of today's episode of the John Capish Show podcast, our friends over at Miracle Made. 
Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Miracle Made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. When they arrived at our house, my wife Anne loved to feel them so much, she couldn't even wait for me to get home to put them on our bed. Miracle Made has self cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevents up to 99.7 of bacterial growth leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Miracle sheets also have incredible comfort and quality. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. So go to TryMiracle, that's T-R-Y-M-I-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash Campia to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40% and if you use our promo code CAMPIA at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA and use the code CAMPIA to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA to treat yourself. And thank you to our friends at Miracle Made for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast. By the way, before we get into the live questions, we're not talking about like nobody watches Chucky. Had a bunch of people. That's a bad take, Campia. Lots of people watch Chucky. Really? We're in it now. Really? Okay, let's look at some numbers. Uh, NCIS, that stupid show that our grandparents watch. You know how many people on average watch an episode of NCIS? Nine million. Yeah. Nine million. Old do you know how many crime. Do you know how many people uh, you know how many people watch uh FBI that series FBI? Yeah, I don't you know, know that anybody that watches series. it personally, but 9.5 million per episode. How many people do you think on average watch Chucky? Guess? 1.2 mil? How many? 700,000. I don't know. <laughs> what 1. was your first mil. number? 1.2 million. Oh, way too high. Okay. Well, way you looked at high. me wrong when I said 700,000. <laughs> 700,000? Oh, that's more than double than what it actually is. Oh. I was about to say 300 something. 330,000. That's so so you can come at me. Lots of people watch Chucky all you want. Go ahead. Feel free. No they don't. I mean, a lot more people watch Chucky than watch the John Campy show. That's for sure. <laughs> but we're not the standard of gold excellence, are we? Anyway, there's that. All right. I hope to someone we are and to that person. Oh, bless you. <sighs> There's such and somebody's saying it's more than the CW shows. No, it's not. <laughs> Even in their low shows, they had more viewers than that. Anyway, with that down, guys, <laughs> let's go on to the most important part of the show, which is hearing from you guys, your thoughts, theories, questions, and opinions. So, Chris, what do we got up first? We start uh, with... First up would be Wesley. All right. Wesley Cunningham, one of three. Yeah. After dissertation defense this week, I've finally been able to catch up on movies. Dune 2 Wednesday, had nice. to catch IMAX, Godzilla X Kong yesterday. Don't think I've ever seen such a back-to-back -back contrast between deep intellectual <laughs> character-based story and straight smashy smashy nonsense. Pretty sure G and K killed every brain cell I used for my defense, but hey, at least it was a fun time, lol. You know Man, what? after after a dissertation, I hope you do something real stupid to just be like, I need to put my brain on autopilot. Anne has, has started working on her dissertation Ooh. defense yeah so it's 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 a pain in the ass you know what but you just came up with the greatest idea for the next godzilla x kong godzilla kong versus sandworms mm -mm. oh mm -mm. i mean I'd i thought that. you were going to say they become lawyers <laughs> they become lawyers so my it's mind was suits, going elsewhere suits middle or not middle earth is a uh, hollow earth there we go you got suits los angeles coming out suits <laughs> hollow earth uh yeah that is a uh, quite a contrast in <laughs> In a double feature, 100%. So Kong and Godzilla working in a corporate environment. Yeah, yeah. and you bring in Mothra Markle. Mm -hmm. Mothra, Mothra Markle. Oh. I'll just see myself out. I'm sorry about that one. Mothra Bye. Markle. <laughs> All right, what's next? I can't help you there. Raymond there. <laughs> From Raymond. To an officer and a gentleman, never say die, chappy. There are so many iconic lines that Lou Gossett Jr. gives him that you cannot repeat. <laughs> you cannot repeat, even not on a YouTube as, show. They're not as bad as Full Metal Jacket. That nope. One. Yeah. But, nope. But I understand what you mean. Yeah, I mean, oh, God. it's it, You know, I got to go back and rewatch that again. That is really such a good movie. All right, what's next? All right. From Chance. Uh, 
give, giving us a two hundred dollar super chat. You're reading that right. What? Oh my gosh! Chance. Chance. Thank Chance. you so much, Thank man, you. for supporting our channel on that level, dude. That's incredibly generous of you. It, I. And everybody who watches the show, thank you so much for supporting us that way, man. What does Chance have to say? Who cares? Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Chance says, what film has had the most profound impact on your life and why? Mine would have to be The Breakfast Club. Interesting. In reality, uh, okay, so I'm going to give you two movies, okay? And both are for very different reasons. One is obviously Star Wars, right? That, that movie, particularly the first three, really dictated the direction my whole life went in. I mean, it, it started, it's my earliest childhood memory is my mom showing me Star Wars. And it kind of started my lifelong uh, love for movies and ultimately kind of altered the course of my career and, you know, like leaving law and doing, it's just, it is so so influential, so impactful, the most uh, the, the biggest example of how imagination, a movie that just fires your imagination into activity. It's just fabulous. Okay. Star Wars. The other one though, well, on a more limited scale that made me walk out of the theater and just want to sit down and ponder life for a bit was the documentary. And I'm hoping getting the title, right? Uh, won't you be my neighbor? Hmm. Oh, the Mr. Rogers documentary. It's beautiful. Um, because in a world I want to, I'm going to get myself into some trouble with this and I just don't care. Um, in a world with a lot of fake spirituality and political power based religion, seeing this story about Mr. Rogers, uh, an ordained minister actually live a life and give an example of what a true person of faith is. There, there, I said this when I first saw the documentary. I said, there are movies that, um, what's the best way? How, do, how did I say at the time? There are movies that make you look at the world differently. And then there are movies that make you look at yourself differently. And that movie for me was so profound and so incredible. Um, I remember there, there's this fantastic scene in it where Mr. Rogers used things happening in the real world to try to teach important lessons to children. And there was this big thing. I've talked about this on the show before, but in case you didn't hear it, <clears throat> there was this thing going on where there was a big news story going nationwide where like in a lot of hotels across America, black people weren't allowed to use the pools. And there was this video footage that started going around because one uh, hotel manager couldn't get the black guests out of the pool. So he started pouring bleach into the pool. It was a big national thing. So what did Mr. Rogers do? Mr. Rogers got one of the cast members who was playing a police officer and he played a mailman. And I can't remember which one he was playing at the time, but he, uh, it was one of the black guys who was on his show. And he did this thing where he, it was a hot day. So he invited him into the backyard with him and they sat together and both put their feet in his little kid pool and enjoyed some lemonade together. Make no mistake about it. Mr. Rogers today would be labeled as a woke loser. He was a real fucking man. Like, Mr. Rogers is the man because he actually, he had a systems of beliefs and he lived it. And he example, and I remember there's never been a movie for me that I walked out of that made me really what really wanted me forced me to re-examine my own life and how I want to live. And that movie did that for me. And, and it was just, um, absolutely incredible. Can, absolutely incredible. Can I, the first movies that actually I, I got messages for, or what I, I took something from was, um, uh, cadence. Do you remember cadence with Martin? Sheen? Oh Yeah. That was the very first movie I watched, and I, I, it actually impacted me afterwards. And also, Pump Up the Volume, that that movie. Like, I understood the meanings of both those movies at an early, at a young age. Those were the movies that I will never forget. Those are my movies, so I don't know. Oh, by the way, one, one more story from that documentary, because yeah. it's totally movie. That same actor who played the guy that he brought into his pool with him, later on, they were talking to the documentary, they were talking to this uh, to the actor, 
the actor was gay secretly. And he never wanted Mr. Rogers to find out because Mr. Rogers, he was an ordained mister, all that kind of stuff. So later towards the end of the show, he decided he had to tell Mr. Rogers, Fred, what was the truth of them. And he, it, th you should just see this because this actor is telling the story and he's bawling. He's weeping. And a lot of people in the movie theater started weeping. He said, I expected him to reject me. I expected him to throw him because of blah, blah. He wrapped his arms around me. He hugged me. And he says, I love you just as much right now as I did whenever. And I love you for you. And, and, and it's just like, where are the human beings? And, and more importantly, why the fuck am I not more like that? I mean, it, it's again, that's why I love that movie so much because it really makes you want to examine yourself. And I love movies that can get close to doing that. So those are the ones that have a big impact on me. Chris, do you have some movies that have made a big impact on you? Well, we'll, we'll just finish with Fred Rogers first because if you haven't watched his Lifetime Achievement Award speech, do yourself a favor and Google that and watch it. It is beautiful and he talks about how a job in television is a job in service and it is one of the most impactful things that I've ever seen and is one of the things that made me want to do all of this. Um, mine's going to seem less uh, deep and and Does it rhyme cool. with puppets? Yeah, it was it, the Muppets opened <laughs> Does up. Does it rhyme with puppets? The, the Muppets opened me up to everything. Like seeing the Muppet movie <laughs> as a kid introduced me to comedians. That's how I mm. first stumbled on Steve Martin and asked my parents if it was okay for me to watch those movies or see The Jerk. It, it's how I found out about Mel Brooks. Is it okay for me to watch those movies? It wasn't, but we did. Um, <laughs> it's how I learned about voice acting. It's how I learned about comedic rules and breaking the fourth wall and all these things. Mm. And as a little kid who didn't have the the verbiage or the means, because no one in my family acts, no one in my family is a performer. It was a, uh, well, I want to do that, but I don't know how to explain that. I always loved the great Muppet Caper when I was a kid, the one in New York. <laughs> so oh. good. Yes. <laughs> Love that one. All right. What's next? Oh, by and again, uh, Chase, man, thank you so much for, yeah, Chase, for supporting us on that level, man. That's incredible. Thank you, dude. Oh, Chance. Chance. What did I say? Chase. Did I say Chase? Sorry. Chance. Thank Forgive you, Chance. Uh, from Juliana Goodwin. Hey guys, to uh, it's Broadway Geeky. I always wanted to know, John, if you knew Anne was Ray's sister when you met her, and if not, did Ray pummel you when he found out oh. you were dating his sister? <laughs> Bring on the filthy. I'm well, not I mean, that type of brother. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you, no, the, actually, I, I have had a couple of people with this must understand that think that I knew Ray first and that I met no, Anne through Ray. No, no it was completely the opposite. Like, I met Anne, yeah. um, and I didn't meet anybody in her family because. Anne lived, actually lived about an hour away from me because I was living in Hollywood at the time when she and I met and she was living out in uh, Corona. And so <laughs> I, it was a good six months that we were in a relationship before I find, you know where I think I first met you? It was the Oscar De La Hoya Manny Pacquiao fight. That's right. You brought soul over. I, I remember that day. Um, yeah, she didn't expose the trash until after. <laughs> after, <laughs> after she got hooked. <laughs> Him hooked. She didn't, she didn't, uh, let the skeletons out. Let the skeletons out of the closet. Like, I have a brother. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, well, and, you know, and I met, I think I met uh, Tommy, Kevin, and Ryan yeah, first. Because yeah. we did a Vegas trip. And these, th you got, these three guys are basically family to us. Um, and so these three guys were also in the Vegas trip because they've known Ray and Ann their whole lives. And that's where I met them. That was about four or five months yeah. after we started dating. Um, so, yeah, that was... Yeah, it was actually a long time before I met Ray or, or your, yeah, your family. I, 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 I've been fortunate enough to uh, grow up with two intelligent. Uh, they make good choices, my sisters. So, like, I have no problem at first. It's, a, it's only if there's, there's troubles during it where I might be that brother. But before then, I'm, I always trust their judgment. So it's never yeah. been a... Yeah, I'm, I, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna air some dirty family laundry. I've right never now. had to guide them through like <clears throat> weeks. They they've been able to survive on their own. Is what I'm saying. I got one problem though. What with both of your sisters, both of them. All right, I'm gonna air dirty family laundry right oh, now. Oh no, don't. There's a stereotype out there about the wives always being late. You know, there's that stereotype, and stereotypes are you know sometimes there's truth to them. A lot of times there's not. Right. The aura girls are the poster children of can never be on time never for anything. Oh, I 
dislike that so much. My dad. <laughs> thing. It drives my, me no. crazy. My dad would wait for hours. We're supposed to be mm -hmm. at the casino at 11. <laughs> we don't get there until 1 because someone needed eyelashes or whatever it was that day or whatever it is. They take so long. They take so long. I, I remember, like, we were supposed to meet some friends of ours a couple weeks ago. We were supposed to meet them at the restaurant at 7 p.m. So I'm sitting in the living room since six o'clock and it's now seven. And I'm like, hon, you almost ready? And she's literally just stepping out of the shower. It's like, <laughs> no, not yet. And God forbid that I should say, maybe we should hurry up. Don't rush me. Like if that's, that's the big thing. And actually read me this joke the other day, the other morning, she said, um, when my wife says, I'm just going to be five more minutes, she means she's just going to be five more minutes. You don't have to remind her every 20 minutes, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> yes, at least she, and your other sister. Oh, she's worse. Even worse. Well, it's like, we're meeting for lunch at 12. Great. It's 1.30. <laughs> we're it's just all leaving. Up. Text, just leaving. Yeah, text, just leaving now. So, on our way. So it's, it's you two Canadians that are suckers. Yeah. You're the guys who put up with it. Yeah, my brother, <laughs> Olive's husband, my brother-in-law, is also Canadian. So, yeah, yep, we just yeah, put up with it. it. No. Mm -mm. We're the uh, opposite. Yeah, no, Logan's yeah. the one who's like, we can get there 15 minutes late. I'm like, how dare you? We'll be there 15 minutes early. <laughs> yes, you know, because that's the actor mentality, yeah. right? My dad was saying, like, my dad was, was very much, when you tell somebody, now, he wasn't telling us this with meeting friends for dinner, but with, like, meeting people you're working with. They're like, when you tell somebody you're supposed to meet at 6 o'clock, those people are doing things in their day to make sure they're where they're supposed to be because you're supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. When you're late, you are <clears throat> disrespecting them. You're telling them they're not worth you making sure you're there on time. And it's like, that was drilled into me. Yeah. Uh, like, I remember my dad talking about that and that is was drilled into me. And so like, it's one minute to seven. We're supposed to meet people somewhere. And I'm like, looking at my watch well, and like, I'm getting anxiety. It's mm -hmm. like you've been undrilled. I've been undrilled. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure I like go the other side of this though, and I'm overly communicative because, like, when I'm going to be like seven minutes late here, I'm like, "You guys, I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah, sorry." Yeah, no, no, and that's exactly. There's so much traffic, be, right? and I want to die. I look at the text five minutes late. I'm like, yeah. "Oh, she's going to be <laughs> and, late." A oh, hey. All right, let's All keep right. going here. What's next? <laughs> From uh, Kevin sending in a fifty dollars super oh, chat. Oh, Kevin, Kevin, thank you, man, you so much, dude. Today. This Pirates of the Caribbean reboot is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. <laughs> ah, Joking mine, so I cannot take credit for it. Oh, thank you guys for all you do. Love supporting the best show in the world. Oh, Aww. thank you so much, man. Look, I, I will say this. Anybody who's saying it's a bad idea to do another, then you've got an agenda. Look, could another Pirates of the Caribbean movie be a disaster? Absolutely. 100% it could be. Absolutely could be. But there's no reason not to take a shot at it. I haven't seen any. You've never seen any of the Pirates no, of the Caribbean? No, it's just, you know, when it, it's something doesn't look like it's my thing, I just don't watch it. So oh. you got to respect that, right? You know? Yeah. I think you might like I the think, first I think, one, I think you're going like to need to watch them, one, though. though. I think, I think you fun. at least need to watch the first one. Yeah, okay. The first one, I think, is the best one. Um, but, I mean, there's there's no reason not to try it. Yeah, true. I mean, this. That, uh, listen, a reboot of that thing could easily be a five, six $600 million movie. And it could be a disaster, just like any movie they put out. But I, I think like the IP and the whole idea of pirates and adventures on the high seas, go for it. Give it a shot. For it me, might work, might not work, but it's worth taking a shot at, I think. For me to watch this new one, you got to have that the main actor be someone like that I would go to the theater for. Like, that's like how you... Like no, yeah, no, he's not. he's not that... I, he could be the British Timothy officer. Chalamet. I don't... I, you know what? Listen, I think Timothy Chalamet is one of the best actors on the planet. I don't think I could buy him as a pirate. Yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah. He, unless he just, unless he's in like one piece and he's like Like Luffy? Yeah, he's Luffy. That makes like, sense to me. Yeah, I could see him as Luffy. <laughs> yeah. I could totally see him as Luffy. But that's that's about the only pirate I could see him playing. Yeah. yeah. Who who do you actually see? Like in your head. I don't well, it doesn't even have Johnny Depp. I mean who's, it doesn't have it doesn't even, a reboot doesn't have to be a Jack Sparrow. A reboot could just be oh, a new, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be a totally different pirate or oh, okay. whatever. Yeah, perfectly fine. All right, what's next? And, from, and again, Kevin, thank you so much for the support, man. Really yeah. appreciate that, dude. From Damaris Love. Rest in peace, Chappy Iron Eagle. <laughs> yep. <sighs> I mean, listen, he was so good that when they did Iron Eagle 2, 
they literally killed off the lead of the first movie in the first <laughs> five minutes <laughs> and then just did the whole rest of the second film with just Luke Gossett Jr. Yeah, yeah, I remember and, that. And that was work sweet. in Roots. I mean, he won an Emmy for it. it was before incredible. he won his Oscar, yeah. yeah. Just I think it was just like months before yeah. he won his Oscar. And it was a role Emmy. that he originally was like, I don't know if I want to do this. He didn't even want to do Fiddler. Um, All right, what's next? From Chef Rigo. Chef Rigo. Oh, Rigo. Oh, Today's my birthday. Happy birthday, Chef. So we get free, free Shogun, Shogun today. We get we get it free. <laughs> the big three O. Oh, oh my gosh! Do you guys remember how you 30, celebrated 30. your thirtieth? Uh, <laughs> it was I so hate, recent. Dirty thirty. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I you stop remembering after I went, a little while. <laughs> I'm, I'm in in the best interests of my own health. I cannot answer that question. Oh, oh I can, because my mine was bougie. Um, my mom and I are exactly thirty years apart. So for my thirtieth and her sixtieth, we went to Italy together, and we went to uh, Positano and Lake Como, and I pointed out uh, Padme's palace, and my mom didn't give a fuck. <laughs> it was magical. Cool. Where I was like, "That's a Star Wars thing," and she was like, "No one cares, Christine." <laughs> no one cares. Literally, no one cares. <laughs> All right, what's next? She's like our chat. <laughs> Basically. Happy birthday, buddy. Happy birthday, uh, Chef Rio. Jay Loco. Uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, or Godzilla X Kong was so badass. My ranking list for fucking fun and dumb Titan action only is uh, one, G and K, two, King of the Monsters, three, G versus K, four, Skull Island, five, Godzilla, and six, minus one. <laughs> LOL. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Whoa, for whoa, dumb fun. For dumb fun. For dumb fun, yeah. Sure. Because listen, there's, there's, I mean, there's a lot more action in these films than say Godzilla. Godzilla minus one is clearly a, a, a great movie, yeah. but he's just talking about like just action. There's way more in these ones. I really, I actually really like Skull Island. Yeah, I, I, I know too. not not everybody did, but for whatever reason, I, I remember it. the first time I saw it, I'm like, you know what? This is actually pretty good. Yeah. I love John Goodman's character. And, He's great. Yeah, and John C. Riley's character. Mm -hmm. I liked it. Yeah. Oh, I really did like John C. Riley's character. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. What's next? From Dwayne Fernandez. You guys catch uh, the three body problem yet? I'm only on those first. I've got to the two first episodes. You two, done. yeah. I finished three last night. Okay. Did? okay. Yep. I have not started yet. I I'm going to, to too. but I have not started yet. I keep hearing really good things about it, so it's I got to get on fabulous. it. Fabulous. What do you think of episode three? Just don't get attached to anybody, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense. Game of Thrones. Yeah, I didn't know it was going to be like this, but yeah. Yeah. All right. What's next? From James Wheeler. Happy Friday, everyone. Oh, and this is a $20 super chat. Oh, thank, thank you, you James. 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 Happy Friday, everyone. Because I love Shogun so much, I'm doing a rematch of Kurosawa. Mm. Last night, I watched Evan Samurai. A rewatch, probably, right? Yeah, I probably meant yeah. rewatch. Or he's fighting the movie. Yeah, that's true. Or oh, he's fighting the movie. He's just, yeah. Um, what is really neat is I've seen a lot of articles in the trace. Because, you know, I have my news feeds, right? And I've seen a lot of articles lately. Watching Shogun? You should watch this. The seven movies to go and check out if you're watching Shogun. Here are three series that you need to get on board with if you're watching Shogun. Like, so there's there's a lot of that going around, and that's great. I, I think that's awesome. Actually, I think I saw a number that the number of VOD rentals of The Last Samurai have actually kind of gone up a bunch Dang. ever since Shogun came out. And again, Guys, it's the best show on TV right now. If you guys aren't watching Shogun, get on it. It's absolutely fabulous. If you like Shogun, you should be watching Bluey. <laughs> mm -hmm. watching. I mean, you should be watching Bluey, though. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Jared Opperfeld. Godzilla X Kong is dumb, but fun. <laughs> you come at the Kings, you will lose. Uh, the Kings. Yeah. That's and and I like it. Look, this is going to be more debate. But... All right, okay. I'm going to put up my hand, guys. For those of you who don't want to hear anything about the movie... Okay? I knew you could have all the help. If you don't want to hear anything about the movie, mute while I have my hand up, and then when that. I put my hand go, down, yeah. you can unmute, okay? As long as my hand's up, have your thing muted. And when I put it down, then you can unmute, okay? Kong wins the fight. When Kong and Godzilla are going at it, Kong knocks Godzilla out. He knocks him out. And uh, anyway, but then it, it goes on to be really great anyway. But anyway, so hand down. Okay, what's next? Crap, I had <laughs> subtitles activated. Yeah. <laughs> I should have mentioned, turn off the captions. Turn off the closed <laughs> captions. All right, what's next? From Mr. I, saw Godzilla X Kong last night. All hail King Kong. Oh, so, go. so good. <laughs> Everyone knows. And listen, seen it, no. there's a scene, like there's a fight scene that they give you a glimpse of in the trailer that happens in the movie. But then there's this camera shot where it kind of, the camera gives a shot of Kong standing there like, this is like, 
holy shit, Kong buff. <laughs> like, even compared to the other masks, like, Kong is, like, all my... Yeah, the, the great. thing between Godzilla and Kong, you see what Kong's been through on his body. Yes. There, yes. there are scars that are there that not didn't even happen in this movie. <laughs> Happened from him living his life in the hollow earth or whatever. And Godzilla, it's hard to see his, his battle scars because he's all scaly and probably... Re re well, here, here's, the, here's the one gripe I have about Godzilla. All right? What, he's too cute? No. Unlike, unlike Kong, over the years and decades, nobody's ever felt the need to give Kong superpowers or to change, you know, what or what, whatever he is. Godzilla has evolved over the years to, he has a lot of superpowers. Like Godzilla has a lot of superpowers, including a 10 times Wolverine healing factor. So that's, yeah, you're never going to see any scars on Godzilla because he, yeah. like even in minus one, when he blows up into a million pieces, his cells will reform and he'll come back and be better than ever. Or he can do this nuclear thing, or he can absorb that or he can do whatever. But they put all of that on display in this movie and they do it in a really fun package. Yeah. Like they make it really good and that's the way they do it with Godzilla. Let's not deny the power of like a, a an actual real ape. No one's going to want to oh, be in a cage yo, with a yeah. real ape. That thing will tear you up. So Yeah. All right, what's next? From Mr. Hank Dunn, do you think Superman is the only DCU movie coming out next year? We have our Supergirl cast, so could A Woman of Tomorrow be in 2025? Well, the Supergirl's cast because she's going to be in the Superman movie. She she makes an appearance there. That's why she's cast. Mm -hmm. That Her being cast doesn't necessarily mean they're getting ready to go right into production on a Supergirl movie. As of right now, I think it is the only movie coming out in 2025. Uh, unless we hear otherwise. Like, they've already got their director for The Brave and the Bold, the Batman movie. They've got their director. They've had their director for a while. So... That could be announced. Production on that and casting on that could be announced any time for a late 2025 release. That could still happen. Uh, but otherwise, I don't. Nothing off the top of my head that I've heard that is also it, coming out in 2025. It's the only movie that needs to come out. Really, it's the ball that gets everything rolling. Superman. Yeah. 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 All right. What's next? From HV3, I am the opposite of you. I love reading books before the movie comes out, although it has backfired from time to time. I also found my two favorite books that way, Ready Player One and The Martian. Yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, it all depends on the kind of reader you are. Because I am like a lot of other people where if I read the book first, it, it taints my experience of then watching the movie. Because I have a way in my head that I think this character should sound. Or in this scene in the book, I have it in my head how I think it should happen in the movie. And if it doesn't happen the way in the movie, the way it does in my book, that the way it does in my head from the book, then it can throw my experience off. And I just feel like I'm not giving the movie a fair shot to be judged on its own merits if I read the book first. Now, there are other people like yourself that maybe don't have to suffer with that. Like you're able to totally easily separate your book experience from them going in and watch the movie. I have a harder time with that admittedly. So I have to do that for myself, but that doesn't mean everybody should. And it doesn't mean you should. All right. What's next? From Mr. Godzilla, seeing Godzilla X Kong tomorrow and super excited. Nice. Glad to see the fan reviews are high up for fun. What Kaiju do you think would fit in the monster verse? IE such as Pacific Rim, Ultraman, etc. Sandworms. What do they call them again? Shia Ablub or whatever? Boring Tremors. Shia with lube? No. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, uh, giant sandworms. Um, that or... Man. I don't I, know. The, I will the say... The kaiju would make sense. I will say we'll at least have two more Godzilla whatever Kong movies. Because two. There's, there's like... Two colors that Godzilla hasn't turned yet. Green, <laughs> That's green, right. green and purple. Well, I mean, the director, Adam Wingard, said he's already got his idea for the third film. Because we got orange, we got blue, uh, and we got the uh, pink now. So there's a couple more colors he needs to go through. <laughs> gotta, get, he, gotta finish that, that, that rainbow, rainbow. That rainbow saga <laughs> as, as he goes through every single color in the spectrum. All right, what's next? From Andy. Saw Abbott Elementary for the first time, and it was the episode that came after the Oscars. It was surprisingly good, and now I want to watch the rest of the show. It's so good, Andy. It's so good and so heartwarming. Anne oh my is gosh. hooked on that show. It's delightful. Mm. Like she's, I've seen about one or two episodes, and, and I got to admit, I mean, they're not Parks and Rec, and they're not The Office, but I got to admit, the couple episodes I've seen were pretty damn funny. There's the one where the, 
the older lady teacher mm -hmm. keeps getting the actors confused. Yes. Uh, who, who, oh, I keep forgetting the name of the actress. She kept confusing. Oh, yeah, that guy. He was in this movie. No, that's totally somebody <laughs> different. I, it was making me laugh my ass off. It looked pretty. I got to actually, man, there's so many shows I got to start watching, but Abbott Elementary is the one I got to go back to the beginning and start watching. If you're missing the altruism of Ted Lasso, I feel like this show is in that same vein of uh, Janine Teagues, the, the Quinta lead character here is just such an optimist. She's got a little bit of Leslie Nope in her mm. of just, she wants to fix these school right, systems. Right, She's right. there for her students, but also often at the detriment to herself and often overextends herself. And it's a really great cast of characters. Uh, it's super fun. I'll give this show a chance when the time comes. Cause right now I'm just discovering Seinfeld. You know what I mean? So the, the shows are gonna have its run in my life. I just don't know when. By the way, Anne has been watching. Well, at that rate, 25 years from now. Yeah. yeah. Well, and started watching Seinfeld in November. She's now halfway through season nine. Huh. She's actually getting kind of sad because she's almost yeah. done. And uh, she's been loving it. But yeah, she's she had never seen Seinfeld. Yeah. Until she bought her and me tickets to go see Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, that's how live. And she'd never heard of him. She's like, she was crying the whole show. She goes, how have I never watched this guy? I'm like, right. And then she decided I'm going to go and watch the show. And she's just about done the whole series. Better late than never. Right? Yep. All right. What's next? From Andy again. Fun fact, Vin Diesel's birth name is Mark Sinclair, which is disappointing to find out because all this time I always thought Diesel was a family name. Oh, ah. Andy. You know what? I'm going to feel dumb. I always thought Vin Diesel was just his real name. I, I didn't know that. I guess Aaron would have known that because Aaron's worked with uh, Vin before. Mm -hmm. She might have known that, but I always, mm. I, I, I admit, I, I, like, I, I'm a big fan of Vin Diesel, and I never knew that wasn't his. I just assumed it was his weird, granted, but real name. Oh, that's good to know. I learn something every day. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Andy again. What's Leon Leonardo DiCaprio's favorite store? Forever Twenty One. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> oh, Andy. <laughs> yep. All right. Leo wasn't next? even in the show notes or anything. <laughs> You're just picking on him now. <laughs> From Dildar, the glorious. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hi. I've been thinking okay. about getting, getting just into, Chris, just me, <laughs> about Dildar, getting whatever, into bro. voice acting, but I've got a speech impediment. Just wondering if it's still possible to be one without it. Oh my gosh, absolutely. It's completely possible to still do voice acting. My incredible instructor over at Groundlings actually has a speech impediment, and when he's improvising doesn't have it. There's just something about that in the moment thinking that it doesn't come up. And then when he's instructing, sometimes his stutter comes back. Mm -hmm. um, one, the way you speak as you do is perfect for something. There's an amazing casting director who always talks about this, Sarah Jane Sherman. She's cast Animaniacs, all kinds of Disney stuff. Your voice exactly as it is, is the perfect voice for a certain character, a certain commercial, a certain video game. That being said, there's so many tips and tricks for all of that so you can feel more comfortable and confident in your speech. A really amazing place to start for free is to go to D. Bradley Baker's incredible, incredible site, IWantToBeAVoiceActor.com. Uh, he's the voice of Eagly. He is wonderful. Uh, he has tons and tons of great information for you. And there's a lot of really amazing resources out there. But just know that the way you talk already is enough. And then you can just always work to strengthen your voice, strengthen your different choices that you can make, and go from there. And by the way, uh, Chris Carr teaches voice acting. Yeah. And she and 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 she teach I had somebody say to me I don't live in LA so I can't do it. No, no, no she does it virtually. Yeah. I don't as let well. you in my house. Mm. I, I teach over Zoom. Speak friend. Yeah, speakfriendstudio.com is where we have all of our stuff. It's me and my husband Logan running things. He does breath and dialect work. He is the the more theater based actor. Uh, he's got a BFA whereas I have a communications major and a lot of personality. But we combine our forces to teach you about the ins and outs of voice acting. We make demos. It's super fun. Yeah, right. You've got a lot of options, Dildar. What's next? From HV3 again, Ready Player One, the movie, was also very good. I hated the book Ready Player Two. I hope they don't make it into a movie. I, you know, it's funny because I've heard a number of people say they didn't completely love Ready Player Two. Um, uh, again, Ready Player One was something that I went and checked out the book after seeing the movie. I love the movie. I had so much fun with the movie. I thought it was just a blast. Um, but I've never, I never did go on to read Ready Player Two or anything like that. Uh, did, did any of you guys read Ready Player Two? I did no. not. No. All right. What's next? Aram, TJ Perry may have had the best movie week ever. 
Late Night with the Devil last Thursday, Sting on Monday, Immaculate on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, that was great. Godzilla X Kong last night, all eight out of 10 or better. There and, continues to be, and especially from the number of the list, again, this is just highlights for me the frustration I get when I hear film fans who think they make themselves sound smart when they go, there's nothing original out there anymore. Yeah. Yeah, there is. It's just not you. It's just you're the problem. Yeah. Like you just don't go watch the original Me? stuff. Because <laughs> right. <laughs> there is, I keep saying this and it keeps being true. There is more original film being produced today than in any other time in the history of the industry. It's out there. It's well, some of it's total garbage, but some of it is brilliant. And it's there if you just actually want to go and see it. All right, what's next? For rum. AD. Hey, John, big fan of the show. Thank you. Do you think Godzilla isn't relatable to the viewing audience? He keeps getting less and less screen time. How does one relate to Godzilla? There, well, yeah, first of all, there is no relating to Godzilla. God's, Godzilla has always kind of been promoted as less of a character and more as one of the natural forces of nature. Yeah. Godzilla is very, Godzilla in and of himself is an environmental message. Mm -hmm. That's what Godzilla is. But if you've seen Godzilla X Kong, Screen time is not an issue. No. Nope. Especially if you look back to the two, if you compare it to like the 2014 Godzilla movie, he gets a lot more screen time in this one and, than before. And there is something, I'm not going to say at all, that they did with him in this movie where I'm like, okay, he's <laughs> just adorable. <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, he, in, they, in he makes it, in they Rome. make it may, yeah, way more yeah. Rela like uh, relatable. Or, I have never in my life in a Godzilla movie gone. Aww. Until this one with yeah. Godzilla. Yeah. You'll know it, Chris, when you Does see that it. Does Godzuki show no. up? No, you'll, you'll, no, no, you'll, no, you'll know. You'll know. But when you'll you know. see it, you'll know what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited. All right. What's next? From Edward Wells. I'm Team Godzilla, but he's a dick attacking Kong. Um, You know what? One of the things that this movie does really well is it sets up, like, because I've heard some people say, like, well, wait a minute. They fought together in the last movie. Why do they... Why are they still mad at each other? Oh, they don't like each other. Mm -hmm. They don't like each other. But there's a great, they, they drop one line in it that says, look, they have an understanding. Right. Godzilla and Kong have an understanding. Kong lives in hollow earth. Godzilla lives on the surface. And she puts it in gangers. She goes, as long as they stay off each other's turf, everything's fine. They have that understanding. And, and that becomes a problem. And they and, go with it. And more specific, Kong protects the people. Godzilla protects nature. Yeah, that's what, how they put it in the movie. And so that's, that's how they stayed separates. in the trailer. And yeah, that's right, right. So, trailer, yeah. so it's, uh, and, uh, Godzilla will always be territorial. He wants to be the number one. If you get in uh, around him, he's going to fight you. That's what it is. Yeah. You know? So, like they they've set up in this universe that as soon as Godzilla senses a threat somewhere, on the, he goes and wants to fight. I mean that that's he's going to take out anything that represents any kind of a right, threat. Right. 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 And like they keep saying, like if Godzilla comes down to Middle Earth or if Kong goes up to the surface, it's then everybody that that's what they said. This one line in the movie is like, like, like if Godzilla goes up to the, or Kong goes up to the surface, we all got to get out of here because they're going to fight and it's going to be a mess. And we all got to get out. I mean, it's actually pretty cool the way they Kong's said that. facial expressions in that movie. In this oh, movie. it's great. Oh, Kong's so facial good. expressions are awesome. So in this good. Movie. It speaks a thousand words. All right. What's next? From, are we on our members now? Oh, to our members. From Om um, Saxena. As soon as Godzilla suplexed Kong, this movie oh. went from a six to an eight out of 10 for me. Right, we probably shouldn't have read that. Yeah. Um, but no, but we said it earlier. Yeah. I, I said so, I said a kaiju suplex. Okay, yeah, I guess so. So, but yes. There are a number of times in Godzilla versus Kong where I like audibly yipped. <laughs> like I was like really excited. When he suplexes him, I'm like, oh! like I just thought, like one of the greatest things. Like halfway through, I think Ray, you said halfway through, it's like, is he suplexing him? <laughs> yep, he's suplexing him. And it was there was like this, like I don't know, awesome. like twelve year old uh, kid that was I was seated next to, and that's we both said, oh shh, oh, at yeah. the same time, <laughs> yep. at the same part. So <laughs> there's some enjoyment to be had in this movie. All right, what's next? For um, Jamie, thoughts on Jeremy Allen White and talks to play Bruce Springsteen in an upcoming biopic? Loved him in The Bear and Iron Claw, so I have no doubt he'll do the boss justice. Yeah, 100%. I, I mean, I, I just think he's incredible. 
Um, he has shown, especially with Iron Claw, that he is not just a one-trick pony with uh, the bear. He's a phenomenal actor. He's got already got a lot of hardware, already won a lot of awards this season. Uh, so I think he could do a really, really good job. I mean, I think there are other actors who could play it as well, but he would definitely be one of the, the better guys to do it. All right, what's next? From Moist Brownie? Hmm. I'm thinking of switching to your beloved Mint Mobile, but yes. do I need to go in and cancel my current phone plan first? Are there any other steps too? Sorry, I've never actually switched phone plans myself before. Thanks. <laughs> you know, it used to be changing phone plans used to be a nightmare. I used to remember it, but then some laws got passed a bunch of years ago where they had to make it easier for you to change. So I think all you literally have to do, like when I changed to Mitch Mobile, all I had to do was like- Give them their phone number, right? Yeah, I just had to, I, I just dealt with Mint Mobile and they handled yeah. everything transferring it all, over. Yeah, it all right? depends if you want to keep yeah. your number. That's yeah, it. and you get to keep your number and everything. So, I mean, and that's whether like, yes, Mint Mobile are obviously big supporters of our show, but I mean, it doesn't matter if you want to switch to AT&T, if you want to switch to Verizon, if you want to switch to T-Mobile, yeah. it should be the same process. You just deal with the person you're going to and they take care of the rest. <laughs> so yeah, it's actually a very, very easy process. Very <laughs> easy love process. Taking them. Yeah, they love taking care of that for you. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Alan Sivka, uh, happy Friday, can't be a crew. Today was originally the release date for Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse. All right. I can't wait to see this. Do you think there'll be an update on the project by CinemaCon? No. Um, Sony is not going to be, Sony, like every year it seems like one of the studios doesn't go and then the next year they do. This year the studio that's not going is Sony. Uh, so even though yeah. Lord Miller have been very prominently on stage at CinemaCon the last couple of years, giving big updates on the Spider-Verse universe, <laughs> uh, not going to be there this year. So Especially after releasing Madam Web, they don't want to show their face. Well, that's not them. That's not Lord Miller. Oh, no, man, Sony. Oh, said Sony. Yeah, they the probably want to kind of lay low for a little bit. Up. Yeah, just lay low for a bit. Wait for the Madam Web storm to pass over. Uh, but no, I don't expect to hear anything by CinemaCon, maybe by Comic-Con, but uh, I can't wait for the third one. All right, what's next? From Dominic Suma, this might be the dumbest question I've ever asked here, but who wins in a fight if the setting was uh, Arrakis, Arrakis Shai Hul Hulud? Shai That's Hulud? The, the sound worm. worm thingy? Or Godzilla? The worm wins. <laughs> On Arrakis? The I worm wins. Know what they are, Jonathan. Well, like, I don't know, because I, I was actually thinking about this during the show, so... <laughs> What does that say about me? But like, <laughs> I was imagining the worm engulfing Godzilla, but then he just blasts through the side of him with his fire. Yeah, like I think you give the worms a little, we're talking about a Titan. A Titan that could absorb nuclear energy and just rip through any. You know what that is to a sandworm? Adorable. Oh boy. That's adorable. Oh, Again, oh I'm, we're talking on Arrakis, surrounded by spice. Mm -hmm. Being almost deities that they are, yeah, the the. So uh, you think a giant sex toy wins? I was gonna say Godzilla's yeah. gonna look at that worm and be like, "I've seen your popcorn bucket, buddy. <laughs> I've seen your popcorn bucket. <laughs> Let me show you what me and my kaiju friends nah. are gonna do to you at the end of this." <laughs> to, to to the sandworm, Godzilla's adorable. Oh, he's adorable. Boy. All right, what's next? Uh, from Danielle, uh, from Daniel, excuse me. What is the difference between Megalopolis and Me Megatropolis? I don't know. Is that a joke or is that a real? No, question? I think it's a question. But well, wait, Megalopolis which... is just a remake. Well, we're, we're talking about sure. the new uh, the Francis Ford yeah. Coppola. Yeah, that's Megalopolis. Yeah, they are. They are two different films. There's mm -hmm. the classic film from decades ago. There's a, they are not related, as far as I understand. They're completely not related. Not actually, a new synopsis just came out for Francis Ford Coppola. I know, and it sounds great. It it actually sounds really good. So apparently, the idea is a New York type metropolis gets mm -hmm. destroyed. Right. And it was already on the brink of destruction, but then it gets destroyed. And then you got these two leaders. One is Adam Driver. One is um, Giancarlo Esposito, who oh, have two wow. different visions for how to rebuild this and what kind of future should they have. And it sounds really, really interesting. But yes, very different, uh, very different film. All right, what's next? From Culture Healers, what's the likelihood that we get an updated Ten Commandments produced by Steven Spielberg, directed Zero. by Chris Nolan, starring John Favreau as Moses, <laughs> Oscar Isaac as Ramses, and Timothy Chalamet as Joshua? Well, I'll now, tell you what. 100%. First, Oscar Isaac as Ramses. Yeah. I I mean, there's nothing about that that sounds remotely possible or appealing. No. But Oscar Isaac as Ramses. So let it be written. So let it be done. I could totally see him doing that. Mm, there's, yeah, do it. That would be, I would actually be down for Oscar Isaac as Ramses. That would totally work. What a work. cheap movie, too. 
Not no budget there. Oh yeah, no, oh, no, yeah. totally an expensive movie on that yeah. one. Uh, except that they would probably use the volume. All right, what's next? <laughs> hmm. From Alvis Dumbledore 1000, I've just done a double feature of Kung Fu Panda 4 and Godzilla X Kong. <laughs> both screens were pretty full, likely due to the Easter break. I found both entertaining for their own different reasons. Kung Fu Panda 4, I still don't think anything's as good as the first Kung Fu Panda. That That's the one that just really caught me by surprise. Um, but yeah, again, Godzilla X Kong, I have no argument with anybody who didn't like it. I could totally understand why you didn't. Totally fair. But I, you know, I just had a blast with it. I'm glad you had a good time. All right, what's next? From Sector Forbes, I'm debating on calling Godzilla X King Kong New Empire one of my favorite guilty pleasures, or actually to use my energy to analyze each scene and counter argue with people that this movie is actually a great movie. <laughs> Work on it. Hey, listen, if you can do it, Look God bless. It. I I, yeah. I am not able to defend it. I watch. <laughs> I, I I can't mount a defense as to, and, on somebody who doesn't like it and thinks it's a bad movie because there's a lot of bad things in it. From from like uh, making a great movie perspective, there are a lot of ways that Godzilla X Kong does not meet the grade. Hundred percent. Yeah. And he so it compensates by being really great at the things it does do well. And so this is going to depend on you and your personality and what kind of works for you and what stands out to you and what affects you most when you're in the theater. For a lot of people, great story, a great narrative, like great characters and all that kind of stuff, that is what is the make or break for a lot of people. And that's totally fair. For other people, maybe a bigger emphasis on the spectacle of the movie and, and do they deliver the fun. It's, it really all depends on you as an individual. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm just saying for me... The good outweighed the bad, and it ended up having just a blast watching it. Yeah. All right. What's next? From uh, Jose Ramirez, uh, or Jose Ramirez. Uh, the trailer. <laughs> I'm sorry. The trailer for <laughs> Unfrosted, the Pop Chart story. I will say this: the film will be nominated for Oscars. Did makeup? Friend, maybe. Did we watch the same trailer? Listen, we we just waxed poetic about the brilliance of Seinfeld. That was a bad trailer. Oh, horrible. That was not a good trailer. And I love movies like this. Yeah. And Especially I, about food. You know what I wanted to see? I wanted to see a funny, but close to the true story social network about Pop-Tarts. Oh, you wanted more serious. No, not serious, but literal. Yeah. Like, make it fun and make it funny, but I, but whatever. Take that aside from what I was thinking it was going to be and just the trailer as a whole. Not a good trailer. And I say this as a huge fan of Jerry Seinfeld. I, I didn't think the trailer was very good. It, I wanted it, to like it. I it, wanted to love it. It didn't make me care about why Pops Tarts is a story that they had to sell. Like, it didn't make me care about that at all. Like, in that trailer, I'm supposed to care about why this thing is like they made this movie. You know what it should have been? Okay, and I say this having not seen the movie. Right. So, so take this with a grain of salt, okay? But you know what it should have been? Flamin' Hot. Mm, right. Yeah. The movie about how they came up with the Flamin' Hot uh, Cheetos, that was a funny, fun, but kind of told the true story of how the Flamin' Hot Cheetos came about. I thought that's what we were going to get with Pop-Tart. I, I thought, or what's it called? Unfrosted? Unfrosted. Unfrosted. Yeah, with the Pop-Tart movie, Unfrosted. I thought it should have been a... Tell the true story of it if there's an interesting story there, but do it for more of a comedic side. And comedic, but but this just looks like airplane, it, airplane with pop tarts. It feels like a drunk history episode <laughs> without the dubbing, well, and I loved that show. <laughs> but that's what this feels stack, like. It has a stack cast. Yeah, it really does. And, but I, and I drunk wanna, history always did. Right. Somebody said, "Yeah, the, the unfrosted yeah. trailer needed more Godzilla." Oh, did we pull a cord? Did no, I? I've been charging my phone with nothing this whole time, and Jonathan saved me. Oh, okay. I just looked down, and what we were like, like I'm like, why is my phone not charging? And we're both unplugged down there. Ah. <laughs> uh, all right, Thank let's you. uh time for two more. What's next? Uh, from the Brandon Salad. Hey, crew. Almost finished with three body problem, and I'm absolutely loving it. So good to hear. Great characters, fascinating story with witty writing, and Liam Cunningham puts on a commanding performance. Listen, you know, coming out of the finale the last couple of seasons of game of thrones a lot of people questioned whether or not house of the dragon would be any good um and it's magnificent but then you had D, &D the guys who ran game of thrones by the way the most emmy award-winning show in the history of the awards 
um, and the most pop cultural hit show probably ever in the history of television. But there was a bunch of people thought, I, I for one, very much do, did appreciate the final two seasons. Uh, they had its issues, but I thought the final two seasons were great of Game of Thrones. But a lot of people who didn't love the last two seasons, which is fair, are like, oh, this three-body problem is going to suck because D&D suck. Whatever. Uh, and so I didn't know how people's response to three-body. Now, I have not seen it yet myself. But I was really surprised that Rob loved it. And that was yeah, the first one to me. That like is shocking. like because like Rob is very precious about the original story. And he was one of the people who didn't really like the final couple of seasons of Game of Thrones. And so I was expecting him to not like this. Even I hadn't seen it myself. And he loved it. And then all of a sudden I started hearing from a bunch of you guys that it's really, really good. So I'm I'm glad to hear it. And I am looking forward to starting to, to watch it though. I want to get through all of Shogun first, but then I will get over to a three body problem. All right, what's next? From Nerds Engage, as good as the Oscars were this year, do you see them opening categories for best comedy and best drama actor and actress as well um, as film? It would open eyes up on more films and doesn't allow for one film to sweep, which can be boring at times. Thanks, keep up the filthy. Here's the problem. Well, there are several problems. One of the big problems is it doesn't prevent a movie from sweeping because unfortunately best comedy, look, even at the Golden Globes where they have best drama and best comedy, the real award is considered the best drama one. The best comedy is considered an also one kind of thing, right? But then you'd also be falling into the same trap that the Golden Globes have every time, which is you're calling that film a comedy, right? Mm -hmm. That film's a musical or comedy, really? The Martian was a musical or comedy, really? I mean, there's a couple laughs in the movie. It's not a comedy. Yeah. And, but clearly they just put it in that category so it can win something. I personally don't think they will. And I really don't think they should. I, I think best movie is best movie. Now I understand best documentary because it's a very, very, very different kind of filmmaking, right? It, documentary is a, is a, is a completely in a, on a DNA level, a completely different kind of filmmaking, but narrative storytelling whether it's comedy, drama, horror, whatever, you're making films. Do you make the best films or do you not? And so, no, I don't think the Oscars will ever do that. And I really don't think they should. And don't they run into the problem where like there's sometimes there's dramas, but then there's an actor that's just funny in that drama. You know what I mean? Like, how would they separate like best? Well, I guess. Never mind. I just answered my question. But I mean, but there are, there's a lot of potential pitfalls in there. So I really don't think they should differentiate. I really don't. All right. Last question of the day. What's next? From Joe Howland. Hey, John and crew, how are y'all doing? Been a fan and watcher of yours since the Man of Steel days. Wow. Was wondering what you think the opening weekend will be for the new Crow movie. Thanks for bringing on the filthy. 26. I've, I've never thought it would be good. <laughs> I, I, listen, I've said for a long time, I don't think this is a movie that should be remade. Now, look, I thought the trailer was perfectly fine. Uh, like I, and I'm somebody who for years has been saying, there. what's the point of making this movie? I don't think... Like at best, it has a cult following. Listen, it has more people saying they love the crow than actually watch the crow. Sorry, that's that's the truth. There's more people out there saying they love the crow than have actually even watched it. It's the same people who watch the uh, Chucky series. <laughs> yes, everybody watched yeah. Chucky. I got the numbers right here, like three hundred thousand people. Anyway, uh, so I don't think they ever should have remade it in the first place, and I don't think there's a big hunger for it out there. I never thought there has been. Uh, that being said, the trailer was better than I thought it was going to be. I thought the trailer looked pretty interesting. We'll see. But I, I don't have a number. Like, because when does that movie come out? Oh, let me check. Because huh? I think we're still a couple of months away from it coming out, aren't we? They've only just had that. We haven't had a chance. I've seen no projections. I haven't had a chance to really gauge buds or anything like that. Do we got a release date yeah, for it? I got you right here. It is June 7th. Okay, so still oh, months okay. away. So I think low. But ask me again when we're like 30 days out. Uh, then I'll have a better idea. But right now, I just think low. All right. Uh, and that'll do it, guys. For today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast, thank you so much for being here making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all of you guys who sent in questions, whether you're one of our beloved YouTube channel members or you use the Super Chat feature. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it and all of us involved with the show. Thank you guys so very much for your support.
Uh, I'll be doing an open mic this weekend, so uh, I'll let you know which it probably is going to be Sunday sometimes. So keep your guys' eyes open for that. I'll let you guys know which day that's going to come. And in the meantime, I want to thank the people in the room with me. Ray Ora. Have a good weekend. Jonathan Voico. See you guys next week. The delightful Chris Carr. Bye, all. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.